Why did John the Baptist end up in jail? That's what we're going to talk about in Matthew 11. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me again. I appreciate you listening. This is going to get interesting. Uh, We are coming off the Sermon on the Mount. We're about in year 29. And now Jesus just in the last chapter called his apostles. But we'll restart out in this particular passage is that John the Baptist turns out he's in prison and heard about what Jesus was doing. So he sent a message to the disciples and wanted to know from Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? And Jesus answered them. He first of all tells John, tell them what we've been doing out here. Tell them what we've been preaching, what's been happening, you know, to people and curing and healing and raising the dead. Tell him that. And then he says another blessed, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So those people who took offense, they're not the fortunate ones, but the people who don't take offense, they are. And so he talks to the crowd, you know, I'm sure everyone was interested because John was a known entity for a longer time before Jesus started his mission. And so people knew John. Again, this area, while the countryside is, you know, big, it's, I think I decided it was like half the size of Illinois, (laughs) if you cut Illinois in half, and then the same size from top to bottom, but side to side, it's about half the width. It's very narrow. I think it went to 80 miles across. News got around, you know, (laughs) it's a very interesting place where people knew of it. So when John had followers, they were kind of curious what Jesus was going to say about John. And so he said, when you went out and looked at John, did he look like he was wimpy and just being blown around by the wind? When you went out, did you see a soft man who was dressed nicely in luxurious clothes living in a gigantic house? What did you see? You saw a prophet. And yes, more than a prophet, he is the one whom it is written, behold, and this is where we're going to read it in ESV, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. We're going to prepare the message of Jesus. And I said before, people were waiting for Elijah. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind. And so they suspected that he was either the Messiah or more likely, this is what I was told, is that he was going to announce the Messiah coming. He was going to let people know who the Messiah was. And so again, every meal of any religious faith of all in Judaism, you had a place set for Elijah because you hope that if he came, you would hear about it quickly because you want to hear more news about the Messiah. Some people, when they saw John, they asked, you know, are you Elijah or are you the Messiah? And obviously, in this case, and we're going to find out why later on Pentecost, John the Baptist was not Elijah, but he was like an Old Testament prophet telling people to repent, telling them the truth, sending them messages from God, and preparing the way for Jesus. So he plays the Elijah role that everybody was expecting. If you said Elijah, you knew exactly what that meant. So he's saying, you saw not a man living high off the hog, not a wealthy man. You saw that Elijah-like man who came to you to prepare you for the Messiah. Who is me. Wow. So he says that this is interesting and this is where it gets complicated. And I was reading all sorts of things about this because it basically says that there was no greater man on earth than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What does that mean? Because he's obviously pretty great. But the idea I think most people settle around is that he's not going to live to see. Jesus pay for our sins. He's not going to see the resurrection. And all these people at that point when Jesus pays the ultimate price are going to be living in that new established kingdom of heaven that is going to bring about the eventual end of pain and suffering. And John will never see that. So he lets them know. And then he says that the kingdom of heaven, this is another confusing thing. I spent a lot of time reading about this, talked about that heaven suffered violence and violence takes it by force. And people seem to think that that means that when people 
before this point were scrambling to get into heaven, doing whatever they could to get into heaven, that people were entering it in a rush with urgency, not just dum de dum de dum here I'm at the pearly gate. They are rushing inside as a refuge. And John is like that because up to the point of John, it was the law. And you were willing to accept him and his message of law. And all that was prophesied until John. And now we have the new time coming. So then he talks about the generation and said that they're like children, you know, sitting, goofing around in the marketplace. And he brings up this interesting quote, which says, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. Meaning we talk to you about the joys. Some people said that a flute was played at a wedding. And again, that wedding groom image where it's a celebration, it's joy. But when we told you the joyful things, you weren't joyful. And then we sang the sad things and told you about the hard things and you didn't mourn. You're, you're children, you're shallow. And boy, that's a hard message for the generations. And then he compares it and says, you know, John didn't eat or drink. Obviously he ate, but bugs and, you know, things he could find. And he said, oh, he has a demon. But then when I come here and I'm eating and drinking with my people, then you just call me a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of sinners. And the idea is that there's no winning here with you people. If we have a person who acts like this, you mock him. And if you have a person who acts like me, you mock him. There's no winning with any of you. And this is our hard messages for people, I think, to hear. And then he talks about these towns that have, you know, he's been working all this time and traveling from place to place and healing people and sending out his message. And he's telling them that the kingdom of God is theirs and that to be merciful to each other and to forgive each other and to be kind to each other. And he got rejected in these two towns, Chorazin and Bethsaida. We don't know where those places are exactly. Now we think that they are very close to where he was in Capernaum, but they rejected him. And he says, you know what? It is going to be better for these towns that are um, Phoenician towns that were in north and now what would be Lebanon, Tyre and Sidon, which historically had not been believers of God, were Canaanites, were people who were not blessed, who have in the past done things to the people of God. It would be better for them than it would be for these towns because they scorned me. They had this chance. They were my children and they turned me away. So then he says, and for you, Capernaum, his town, are you going to be exalted in heaven? And he says, you'll be brought down to Hades. And he's saying that if all the things that happened to you, I did my ministry here. I was stationed here. And if all these things had happened to Sodom, they would still be standing now. But instead, you turned me away. And you had all of this. You had all of me and you had all my messages. And yet you still turned me away when Sodom would have turned. This is going to be judgment on you too. And he says, then I'm thankful to God, the Lord of heaven, that you hid things from the wise and revealed them to children. Because that the smart people, the scribes, the studied people, the educated people rejected Jesus. Again, some of it had to do with pride probably because they believed in what they believed in. And some of it had to do with they were promised a Messiah and people thought that was a relief from the Romans. And if you didn't come to relieve us from the Romans, you're no good. Or if you're going to come here to earth and tell us we were wrong, that is not the message we're looking for. So he said, you've hid it from them. And it wasn't hidden from them. It was all out in public. He said everything in public, but they didn't get it. Even little children got it, probably as a metaphor while the smart people didn't. And this is not a political statement, but it makes me think like, what if the Messiah came like this and you had the people who in universities, no, this is not the Messiah. And then you had the people in power, the politicians and the governors and all the leaders. And they were like, yeah, we got to take this guy out. He's spreading dissent and all the people and making them unrested and unruly. And we can't have this. You can see how that would happen today scoffing from the smart places and scoffing from the places of leadership. And we got to take this guy down. You could totally see that happening. And in this case of Jesus, that's what was happening to him. The leadership 
was ready to take him out. So he says, all these things are handed to me by my father. I know everything he knows. He knows everything I know. And come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And that's great. And I'll give you rest and take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And then he says, quote, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In reading about the yoke passages that are here, it talks about how like a young ox was trained with an older ox or a stronger ox, and that stronger ox would take on the biggest burden, but teach the younger ox how to pull the yoke. A yoke would be like the harness that you would put on an animal to plow your field. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. I will show you the way. Learn from me. I am gentle. I'm not going to be unkind to you. I'm going to show you what it is. And this comparison about the yoke being easy and the burden light is a comparison to all these people, these wise people who have been doing nothing but putting burden on you. And not just that, making you do it by yourself. You have to pay our temple taxes. You have to pay our Roman taxes. You have to do this and you have to do that. And if you're not, you're out. And he's saying, I'm giving you an easy yoke. It's just such a kind message. And I think, too, it says all who labor. Are those those laborers again for the harvest? Is he talking about not just the people who work and are heavy laden, but specifically the laborers for the kingdom of heaven? He is making his family bigger. All right. So that ends Matthew 11. And so some more analysis. Same about time as all of this has been around somewhere around 29 AD. We're still in Galilee. And in this chapter, we have a number of people in here. We have Jesus and the disciples. We have the Pharisees, as always, making accusations. We hear about John the Baptist and messages are being sent back and forth. And we also have the followers of John wondering probably what's going to happen to their prophet. And I assume we see the crowd. I mean, the, the crowd that we've been hearing that followed Jesus around, wanted to listen to him, probably also around as well. So what are some key concepts in here? A lot of this chapter, again, talks about the prophet John, his fate, and the fact that he was strong. He did not live the luxurious prophet life that fake people do, that a lot of the temple priests and everyone else did at this time. He lived a very solemn life. He did not drink. He ate from what's around him. He lived a life of poverty. So we hear about that. But we also find out that he's probably not going to see the Messiah's mission come to fruition through his death and resurrection. We talk a lot about these towns and these people who saw Jesus, and it's not a good look for them. They are going to be condemned because they had all these miracles and all these things happen. And when they rejected him, even Sodom would have returned to God's fold had they seen all this, and they didn't. We also see as a major theme in this chapter that the people who will do his work can come to him. He will show them the way. He will give them rest. He will give them comfort. And that's wonderful. Literary items that we see in this chapter include images of John the Baptist when he says that he wasn't a reed that was shaken by the wind. He wasn't a man dressed up in soft clothes in a king's house. He was not a rich guy, but he was a prophet of old. He gives the image of heaven being taken by violence. Like I said, that's a hard passage to understand, and I guess people have been debating it. But the general message I got from most commentaries were that people are rushing to get to heaven, taking it, entering it in with force because they want to be there. He gives a literary image of the people of this generation being children in the marketplace. And even they, and when they got a happy message, they didn't dance. When they got a sad message, they didn't mourn. And they're not happy with anything. If you get a guy like John who doesn't do anything, eating, drinking, living fancy, oh, he's a demon. Or if you get 
Jesus who eats and drinks with people, oh, he's a glutton and a drunkard. You know, and, and there's just no winning with any of them. He talks about towns and their fate because they turned him away, even though they saw these miracles. And then the one image he gives is about when he gets turned around, that these messages were hidden from the wise and revealed to children means that they didn't get it. These wise people didn't understand any of it. But children, they get it. Simple children, they get it. And that's why I think, too, where people talk about, I don't know, people from the hinterlands, like where I come from, or the North Woods, or, you know, cabins, and these are just a bunch of hicks, and they don't know anything. I have met the most faithful people living in cabins, uneducated, but they knew Jesus up and down. That's the more important thing to know is not these lessons of man, but the lessons from God. And they get it. And while the learned people, they don't. I think we see that pretty true today, too. What this chapter says about the nature of God is he says that he is the new message from John the Baptist. And John will never see it. He'll never see this new covenant and this new message brought before him. He also indicates that God has given people ample examples, complete visions of what is about to happen, his message, where they went wrong in the word and the law of God, and they denied it. Even Sodom wouldn't have denied it. But he keeps trying, and he keeps healing people. What does it say about humans? Well, it's not really a great message about us. (laughs) It says, that people got a chance to see all these miraculous things and they didn't still believe these things. And even Sodom would have done it, that there are these unrepentant cities, that this generation, and I don't know that it's just this generation, I think it's our generation too, are children who are just playing, dance with Jesus in the happy times and they don't mourn with him in the sad times and they're filled with evil. They call people names. They'll call you one name and the next minute they'll call you the next name. It's not a good look for us. My meditation is about the comparison of John in a couple of different ways. First, he is the reed that was not shaken by the wind. Strong man, but he is also the least in the kingdom of heaven. We're going to see in the next chapter, Jesus will be the broken reed. So this image of a reed standing tall or a reed being taken down in comparison. And you think that John got to see Jesus. I mean, obviously that is amazing and fortunate. But what Jesus is saying here is how fortunate are we who come after John, who will have the kingdom of heaven coming to earth, awaiting, knowing what happens next. John never knew that. I think that's pretty amazing. So my prayer this week has to do with, come all to me who labor under heavy laden, he'll give us rest, and to take up his yoke and learn from him. I mean, that's the message I took from this. At times when I feel unqualified to speak about the message of God, that's when I have to take up the yoke and learn from him and take rest in him. Because again, his yoke is easy. That's the prayer I have for this week is that I will remember this when I'm feeling overburdened or overwhelmed. What I'm going to share this week is I want to share with people that exact message that they should take this opportunity to take the yoke on from Jesus and learn from him. He is gentle, he is lowly in heart, and he will give us rest. That's a great message. That's that's what I want to share with people. I think we feel so overwhelmed, particularly people who work in the church, beaten down, just like Jesus got beaten down and yelled at and called names. Interesting, because when it says to take the yoke upon you, none of us want to take a yoke on us. If we were offered a yoke in real life to go plow a field, we would be like, I am not putting that on. We oftentimes reject the yoke, run away from a burden. But in this case, Jesus is telling us to take it on and learn from him. Woo! All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I appreciate it greatly. Remember, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I will pray for you. If you have anything that you want to say, if there's something I could provide to you to make this podcast easier, please remember, too, 
that we have the Notion database. I don't want you to get confused about this. You don't need an account. It is just a link in the show notes. It has the ramps sheets. You can download it. You can listen to this episode. You can, if you know what Notion is and you have an account, you can take the whole database and start filling it out yourself if you want. But this is a resource so that you can look at it and see where it's going. And I hope that that's a help to you. And again, if for whatever reason you can't listen to the podcast, I have a YouTube channel. I'll put the link in the show notes for you to see that so that you can go to YouTube and watch it if for any reason you can't get to my podcast or you'd like to watch this in a web. Maybe there's someone who doesn't know how to listen to a podcast who you think would get some benefit from it. They can just listen to it on YouTube and it's nice and easy for people too. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening and I look forward to talking to you next time about Matthew 12. Matthew 12.